to another episode of Keep It Fictional, a podcast by book lovers for book lovers presented by the Port Moody Public Library. Now, today's episode, as you know, we do a theme every single episode. And with today's episode, we wanted to bring acknowledgement um, to a very special month um, within our country. And this month is known as Black History Month. Uh, and, and although we love to celebrate um, stories from Black authors and authors of all kinds of creeds throughout the year, um, we do want to give a shout out to Black History Month uh, this February um, to honor the legacy and contributions of Black individuals in our country. So today we thought what better opportunity to present to you some of our most intriguing, perhaps most interesting books that we have read by Black authors, whether they be Canadian or perhaps not of Canadian origin. All right, now today on the panel with me today, my name is Liz, I've got Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. I've got Corrine. Hello. Hey, Liz. Hey, Liz. And I also have with us Virginia. Hello. Hello. I made you all speak up and say something. Okay. Well, today, why don't we just jump right into it? I know we've got um, a great selection of books today. We always do. I like to think some. I'm a bit biased. However, um, I think today we've really kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of um, maybe something for a variety of reading tastes. So let's get to it. And we'll start out with Gabriel. So I decided that this week I was going to be reading Brian Plantain by Zalika Reed Benta. So arriving at Eglinton West, Eglinton West Station, doors will open on the right. It's probably what Kara Davis heard over the subway speakers every time that she got off at the stop for Toronto's Little Jamaica. When she was very young, she lived in the neighborhood with her mother and her grandmother. And for a brief period, she was allowed to attend middle school in the area. Even as her mother and Kara end up moving away from the neighborhood, she still orbits Eglinton West. It holds a power, powerful gravity. It's a place of belonging and otherness in equal parts for Kara. Her grandmother calls her too soft. Her mother scolds her for regularly crying. It's obvious to everyone around her that she's Canadian born, despite her desire to be accepted as a Jamaican girl by her cousins, um, by the neighborhood kids in Eglinton West and by her friends at school. Well, she's not Jamaican enough for them. She's clearly not white either. And this is immediately obvious to the other white kids at the good schools that her mother in, uh, insists on putting her in. So this is really a story where Kara is a girl of two worlds. She feels not Canadian enough and not Jamaican enough, certainly not enough for her mother or for her grandmother who are uh, constantly picking at her appearance, her grades, her friends. But it's clear to Kara that as frustrating as this is, it, it comes from a place of fear and love. Uh, both her grandmother wants to make sure that she's not ostracized from the Canadian Jamaican community. Um, and her mother wants to make sure that she doesn't ruin her chances in the world of white academia. Uh, and she very much insists on studiousness for reasons that sort of become apparent in the story. Frank Plantain has this really powerful undercurrent of emotionality to it. And it touches on themes that I think would be familiar to maybe anybody who comes from an immigrant family uh, and has experienced some of the complex intergenerational relationships that kind of come with that. It's definitely a story about uh, kind of like three three generations of women uh, specifically coming from Jamaica. It's very much a story that I would say is rooted in uh, the experience of someone who's who's come from the islands and how they've both lived and thrived in their own ways while holding each other to different standards. Um, so Zalika Reed Benta is a Canadian author. Uh, She's incredibly talented, uh, received a ton of deserved attention for this novel, which I believe is her debut. And she won a few awards. Uh, online, I definitely, 
I I saw it described as being sort of a collection of short stories, but I think it's definitely far more, co more, co more coherent for me, at least, to just sort of think about it as almost like snippets of this character's life as a whole. Although it did, um, it, it sort of does make it easier to almost like compartmentalize when I thought back on it, that these were almost like individual, uh, that each of these stories to an extent could potentially have like individual themes or individual uh, motifs, but it is, it is very much like a, a nice, cohesive kind of look into uh, growing up with the particular cultural context of uh, being Jamaican Canadian and coming from a, a family where you are very much like a recent immigrant um, in the generational sense, not that uh, Kara herself was born in Canada. But I would mention that while there aren't any super hidden content warnings for the story, uh, Kara does experience quite a bit of microaggressions. Um, there's a few scenes where you kind of become a little worried for her safety. And so if you think that's going to be something that might be a little bit of an issue, I would uh, just suggest maybe that you read with caution. Um, I think the book will really would really appeal to anyone who loves reading about Black resilience and perseverance, uh, the experience of the Caribbean di diaspora, microcosms of kind of like immigrant communities in Canada, and also the little memories from our youth that kind of shape us in ways that we don't expect. I think I was surprised at especially the way that she would describe things that I could relate to in the sense that there are these, these tiny moments that you don't realize are going to kind of define a way that you react to the world moving forward or the way that you understand your place in the world because they're so small at the time, but they end up making such a big impact. And for me, I think that was one of the really, really notable things about this story in particular, that it's about the things that you think are going to be ephemeral and then they really aren't. And so I would definitely recommend this. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I would have normally picked up, but coming from Ontario and having uh, been to Toronto many times, uh, I haven't spent too much time in Eglinton West, but I've definitely walked through it. I was very curious about the story and it turned out to be really great. And so I was really happy for that. And I would definitely recommend it if any of those themes sound like they would be interesting to you. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, funny, um, Virginia and I were talking the other day about uh, books that are perhaps short stories or different chapters that um, aren't necessarily, I guess, um, part of, they're all part of one big story, but they kind of can stand alone as well. Um, and whether we liked those or not. Um, maybe we'll ask that later of the panel. We'll leave you all in suspense for now. In the meantime, Corrine, why don't you share with us what you've brought to the table today? I sure can, Liz. And I'm going to here to tell you that I absolutely have cheated. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, trying to pick one book out of a, a filament universe of stars has been very difficult. And so I did read a special book for this podcast um, because it is a book um, whose author I always pick up. If they've got something new, I always, always grab it because I do truly believe and think that this author is a genius. And I also think that they are who maybe one of the best contemporary living writers. Yeah, I'm saying it here. And, you know, just because this author tends to write for children or teens, although when he starts his process, he doesn't know what age group he is going to write for. He just starts writing the story that he wants to write. And oftentimes that will fall into kind of like a middle school audience or a YA audience. Um, but I truly believe that his books can be read and appreciated by people of any age. So the author whom I love with all of my heart, who you may have seen on the Stephen Colbert show, is 
Jason Reynolds. And for the podcast, I read his brand new book, uh, which is a collaboration with his his bestie, his former roommate, uh, the other Jason. Um, so this is Eight Burned All the Bright by Jason Reynolds, who is the, the author and poet. And artwork is by Jason Griffin. So these two have collaborated before. They are very good friends. Uh, Jason Reynolds is Black and Jason Griffin is white. Um, but they are two artists who have kind of like, they describe it as like mind melded on different subjects. And so these two kind of great powers have come together to create this book, which is, oh, it's, it's a smash up of poetry and art, and like heavy on the art, which is kind of why I felt like I cheated because fundamentally this book is three poems <laughs> and not like super long poems. They're kind of like short poems. So, you know, like it didn't take me very long to read it. <laughs> But it was a very powerful and harrowing um, experience because Ain't Burned All the Bright is uh, Jason Reynolds' attempt to kind of describe in poetry the experience of young Black Americans in 2020. And so he has kind of centered these three poems around the idea of breath as a fundamental right. And so he pulls into this the, the three big things that, that impacted Black Americans during this time, um, one of them being the Black, Black Lives protest and, of course, the uh, murder of George Floyd. Um, he talks about COVID-19 and its impact on the community and families. And the third theme is climate change and how, that is, how all of these things are robbing the breath of Black Americans. Um, it is a book about <laughs> that kind of asks, what's wrong with people? what's wrong, um, but is also, I think, fundamentally a little bit hopeful. Um, it is tender. It is uh, because it's Jason Reynolds who um, he, he started reading kind of late. And what eventually drew him into literature and words is rap. And so you can definitely see that that influence in the way that he writes. So he actually didn't read a book until he was 17. He had kind of... Um, grown up in an atmosphere where that wasn't encouraged and um so he but he was constantly surrounded by the the language and beauty of rap that kind of storytelling of his community and so he was really inspired by by queen latifah and had kind of for whatever reason ended up working at a bookstore and then someone's like well you really should like read a book and so he did and he hasn't kind of stopped since and so he brings all of these influences into his writing. Um, and it wouldn't be me talking about Keep It Fictional if I didn't also cheat to promote his other books, um, notably of which, if we're talking about the poetry genre, it's The Long Way Down. Um, this is a National Book Award finalist. It won a Prince Honor, um, Coretta Scott King Award. Um, it is a, an amazing, amazing book. And again, um, Reynolds is always drawing on his own lived experience and the experience of his communities to write these complex, rich characters. Um, this one is kind of inspired by an incident in his own life that um, I believe when he was a teen, he, he saw one of his friends be shot. And that, of course... Um, is kind of like a, a pivotal moment and he he saw it as you know he he could have chosen the path that he did which was to kind of like deal with his grief and and just kind of work through it himself or he could have chosen the path of revenge and this book um in prose really explores how and why someone might go down that other path that he didn't go down um I cannot say enough about Jason Reynolds. He is amazing. Uh, he has an Edgar Award, an NAACP Image Award. He's the Library of Congress National Ambassador for Young People's Literature in 2020. Um, he's got the Prince. He's got the Newbery Honor. He's got the Curtis Scott King Award. Oh, he's everything. He's everything. So yes, um, despite the fact that, again, these labels might say YA or they might be in the juvenile section, do not, do not cheat yourself by not picking up one of the books by, again, uh, an amazing Black author who is so, so wonderfully um, 
writing about community and family and and truly what I believe is is one a, a genius writer of our time. So yeah, Jason, Jason. Thank you, Corrine. I feel like um, we need to add that to our unofficial uh, keep it fictional game for our adult listeners at home. Uh, so every time Corrine mentions BTS or now Jason Reynolds, um, you know, partake in some of a beverage of your choice. We have no responsibility over what comes after that. Just try to Disclaimer. slide it in as much as possible. Yeah, I Jason, Reynolds. Like Jason Reynolds would appreciate BTS because he also appreciates lyricism. Perhaps we'll explore that on a future episode. I feel like we could go down the rabbit hole with that one. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to continue on with the, um, the YA vibe here and um, present to you a book that was one of my honorable mentions honorable mentions in 2021 um, during our best of the year episode. And it was a serious contender um, for my top five. It literally just got eked out. Um, I was so impressed with this title that I, I felt like, you know, I wanted to spend a bit more time to share this one with all of you um, and encourage you to uh, give it a try. So this one is by Farida Abike Iamide, uh, who is a British author. And this one is titled Ace of Spades. Now, uh, amazingly, this was the author's debut work and it went to a bidding war. Um, and it was written when she was only in her early 20s, um, which in hindsight has impressed me all the more. Now, this young adult thriller has been billed by some as either Gossip Girl or Pretty Little Liars meets Get Out. And while the two, the two original titles, Gossip Girl, Pretty Little Liars, are not usually something that's up my alley, Get Out definitely was as a film. Um, so I thought, I'm going to give this one a try, and uh, I have no regrets. So in the story, we've got uh, Chiamaka Adebayo and Devon Richards, and they could not be more different. Now, she is very popular and wears designer labels. And meanwhile, Devon is an introvert. He's a musician uh, and he prefers to fly under the radar and he has decided to keep his sexuality a secret. Essentially, he just wants to focus on his music and get into a good post-secondary school while she who also wants to get into a good post-secondary school is more of a social butterfly. Now, besides being good students, they're both also students at the exclusive Nivius Private Academy. They're also both black. And in fact, they are the only two black students in the entire student body. Now, the school year proceeds as normal. It's a new school year. They're both seniors this year. So what they do is absolutely critical to what post-secondary institution they can move on to in the following year. Um, however, not long before the start of the year, the entire student body, anybody with a cell phone begins receiving text messages, sometimes including incriminating pictures signed off by ACEs. And what Aces decides to text about are the lives of Chi and Devon. And what they reveal is never flattering. So what Chi and Devon initially assume to be a very, very sick prank soon turns into fear for their reputations and their entire academic careers. So their hopes for college and perhaps even their lives are at stake. Now, as the story progresses and they realize that their risk of harm becomes greater, the trust that they have in those closest to them is in doubt. So imagine being in a situation where you feel like the entire school, the entire world has turned its back on you um, and everybody that you thought you could confide in no longer seems like a good confidant. So this 
leads to them realizing, each of them realizing that they need to overlook their differences. Devon thinking Chi is pompous and a snob. Chi being snobby and looking down upon Devon and his uh, class. Um, they realize that they need to look overlook their differences and work together to uncover who Aces is and to figure out who or what they are exactly up against. This book was dark, it was twisty, more twisty than I thought it would be, darker than I thought it would be. Contemporary dark academia that also put a, a huge social justice lens on the lives of these two teams. I did a deep dive into institutionalized racism, sexual identity, class. It covered so many things in what felt like an incredibly fast paced and exciting book. Now, with that being said, this YA title is more on the mature side of content. So if you are an adult who is a reluctant YA reader, who enjoys thrillers, you'll probably find this one quite palatable. Um, I also recommend that you listen to the audiobook if you do get the opportunity. The voice acting in this is superb. The chapters alternate between Chiamaka and Devon's viewpoints. There is a different voice actor for each, and they really do bring these two characters to life, first with their teen angst, uh, and then with their fears and their thoughts and their, their trauma that they're facing. And it, it was just incredible to sort of get that extra added layer to what was already a very exciting story. So again, if you like dark, twisty academia in a contemporary setting, if you're open to reading YA or, um, you know, just wanna give it a try, you wanted something a little darker perhaps, uh, I highly recommend Ace of Spades by Farida Abike Iamide. All right, now we're gonna move off of the YA train and hear from Virginia about a book if, if you've still decided to go with what we talked about earlier, I think is a bit out of your sort of reading box. <gasps> is it a romance, Virginia? Is it finally a romance? No. It's not that out of the, the, the box. <laughs> um, but I do have a memoir for you today. I know what is happening. Um, but I have reasons, reasons. Because first of all, I thought for Black History Month, this is a very appropriate story. It's an inspirational story of a Black Canadian who has made it to the, become the first in his field to break the color barrier. So I thought that was a really good one for this month. Um, it also gave me a chance to talk about hockey, my other passion. So obviously, got to do it. And but you know what, let's be real here. We're always being honest here. The real reason I pick up this book in the first place is because of the person who wrote the foreword. That's that's the only reason. So I know. Um, so I have for you today, Willie, the game changing story of NHL's first black player by Willie O'Ree himself with Michael McKinley and the foreword written by Jerome Aguila. Jerome Aguila is the only reason why I started watching hockey. He is the reason why I fell in love with the game. He's always going to be my favorite, favorite player, no matter how many more players come in the time that I am still alive. And of course, that's also the reason why I will always, always be a Flames fan. Go Flames! Good job beating Toronto last night, by the way. Anyway, um, yes. So because of that, I read a memoir. Now, when Jerome was seven years old, he was at his first hockey tournament. And he was very excited because this is the first time he went out of town to go to a hockey game. And he was at the concession booth and he was waiting to get some fries. And then there were two players in front of him that was from the other team and they were lining up. And suddenly one of them turned around and he did a double tick. And he was like, wait, why are you playing hockey? Black people don't play hockey. And it's clear that this guy thinks that Jerome does not belong there because he is black. And this is the first time Jerome had ever had someone made a comment about his race 
in relation to hockey. Like he has never heard that before and he doesn't quite know how to respond to that. But of course we know that is not true. Black people do play hockey in the biggest league in the world, the National Hockey League, the NHL. Just look at Willie O'Ree. Willie O'Ree was from Fredericton, New Brunswick, and he is the great, great grandson of Paris O'Ree, an enslaved man. Willie talks about how he knows that Paris O'Ree was gifted to an army officer as a payment for their military service along with a few other slaves. But somehow in the late 1700s, he has managed to escape to Canada. And he always wondered, where will I be if Paris O'Ree, his great great grandfather, has not had the courage to run away and escape and change the, his entire life? When he was young, like many, many Canadians, he knows he wants to be a hockey player, a professional sports player. And there's kind of two sports that he's thinking of, hockey and baseball. Loves hockey. He remembers the family, how he, they do pond hockey. And he remembers how his, his brother Richard would be extra tough on him because his brother really believes that Willie is going to make it one day. And so, you know, like he's always super tough. Um, and he also played baseball. He also loved baseball. And it is through baseball that he has his first taste of being in a professional league. He was invited by the scouts to go to a training camp in Atlanta, Georgia. And that is also where he has his first taste of what it's really like to be a Black person in the States. He landed in the airport and the first thing he saw was the washrooms the washroom for white folks, and then the washroom for the people of color that he is supposed to go use. He remembers after games, they might go to a restaurant. And even though his teammates have already arrived, got a table, they might have to relocate because the restaurants won't let him in because he's black. And he remember how glad he was, even though he so, so, so much want to stay and be a professional player. He was so glad when the team call him in and say, hey, you know what? You're great, you're really good, but it's not quite working out. I think, you know, like we'll have to send you back. And he was so happy that he doesn't have to stay there any longer because of all that racism that he has to face every single day, not just on like the field, but also off. And he still remember on his way home, he was taking the bus and he has to sit at the back of the bus because that's where black people belong. And so he thought when he got back to Canada, you know what, forget it, forget about baseball, let's focus on hockey because then maybe I can still stay in Canada. And of course, still lots and lots of obstacles facing him. There is, of course, the racism. You know, there is at that point no other black hockey player. Nobody in the NHL is black. And he remembers um, through baseball, he remembers meeting Jackie Robinson, who is the first black player in Major League Baseball. And he remembered Jackie asked him, like, hey, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And he was like, I'm going to play hockey. And Jackie Robinson, even Jackie Robinson said, well, Black people don't play hockey. There's no Black NHL player. And Willie was like, well, you're looking at one. And little did he know that one day his name and Jackie Robinson's name will be uttered in the same sentence as the first Black people that have made it to their leagues. Of course, like I said, there are Black people playing hockey. And Willie knows quite a few of them. And it was... Um, Herb Gahard Carnegie, that he, for him, as the person that has been good enough to be in the NHL. But at that point, he was not able to make it because the managers in the teams have basically say, no, we don't want any Black people in our league. In fact, one of them has allegedly said, well, I'll pay anyone any amount of money if you can change the skin color. If you can change the skin color of Herb Carnegie again, yes, sure, he can play for my team. Those are the kind of comments that he has to face and all Black players have to, play, have to face. Not only that, there are also practical reasons why, you know, like there's not, a, there's hasn't been any Black pay, players in NHL because there are only six teams. So there's like, you have to be like 
good enough to be one of the 132 players that can make it to the team, but also that the chances that you stay employed in the NHL is much less than being in any other professional league. So for a lot of reasons, uh, for practical reasons, a lot of players just stick with the minor leagues because they know that they will stay employed, which means food on the table for many of them. But there is one other reason which makes this story even more amazing and how Willie made it to the NHL is that he is blind in his right eye. When he was 19, just two years before he finally made it to the NHL, he, the, a puck flew right into his eye, broke his nose, cracked his cheek, and he lost his eyesight. And he was told by the doctor that he would never be able to play hockey again. But Willie really, really wants to be a professional hockey player. He wants to make it to the NHL. He knows he has the speed. He knows he has the skill to do it. So he decided to keep that a secret. The only person that knows about it was his sister not even his parents. It was like years and years later when they find out that he actually has lost his eyesight. So to compensate for that, he has to try to relearn how to play hockey, really, because without peripheral vision, you have no idea who's coming behind you. So instead, he has to like turn his whole body to see if someone is coming behind to check him. So he has to relearn, but he won't give up. And so after playing for the Quebec Aces for a number of years. In 1959, he was finally called up by the Boston Bruins to replace an injured player. And on January 9, 18, 1959, he was told to get to Montreal and he stepped on the ice and played his first NHL game against the Montreal Canadiens. And by the way, sorry, Liz, I'm going to have to say the word Boston Bruins a bunch of times. I know that hurts. Anyway, so he joined the Bruins for the 60-61 season, and during that season, he was the only Black player. And he has many incidents, all the racial slurs that he has heard from, not just other players, but of course from also the fans. And at that point, a penalty box is not a box. It is just an open space where any fan can come down and get you. So he has many incidents where fans will come and try to say things to him, try to do things to him. And he remembered there was incident even where he, the whole Boston Bruins has to be escorted out of the arena by police because the fans were like, because of a racist incident that the fans, they know that there's going to be trouble. And so they have to protect the players that way. He didn't play long in the NHL Hockey League because eventually they did find out that of course that he is blind in one eye. And so he only played 45 games, but he did play 22 years in a minor league hockey game, win a lot of scoring title in the Western Hockey League. And after he retired and stopped playing hockey when he was 46, it wasn't until 1974, 20 years later, that another Black player made it to the NHL. But his NHL career has, is not ending there. In 1994, NHL approached him to ask him if he wants to become their diversity ambassador. They have a program at that point called Hockey is for Everyone, and they wanted to spread the joy of hockey, spread their sports among everybody. And he became a youth mentor to spread that news, to make sure that families who cannot afford to play hockey, to make sure that can get gear, he goes and deliver them to the families, to make sure that young kids, young boys and girls, of whatever race can see him, can see someone that look like them and see that, yes, you can, if you want to, you can also make it to the NHL. You can also play hockey. You don't have to listen to all those people who tell you that to just stick with basketball or whatever. Um, and he became that icon and that inspiration. He won so many awards after this. In 2008, he won the Order of Canada. In 2018, he was inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame as a builder, a builder, which means it's someone who has made significant contribution to the development of the game. He's got an ice ring in Boston named after him. He's got an arena in Fredericton named after him. And just this year in January, the Boston Bruins retired his number 22 to show how much 
he has made a difference in the game. But it's interesting to hear, despite all those honors, you would never, all the players who have met him, who have looked up to him, who have seen someone look like them, made it to the NHL, they always tell you how humble Willie O'Ree is. Um, one of the stories that I read was that his Order of Canada, the Order of Canada, was actually hung right next to his employee of the month plaque when he was working as a security guard. They were hung right next to each other because for him, work is work. It doesn't matter what it is. It is equally important and you should be proud of that. Without Willie O'Ree, I am pretty sure there may not be a Jerome McGinley. There may not be a PK Jordan, Malcolm Subban. They will not be a Wayne Simmons. They will not be a Joe Ward. They will not be an Anthony Stewart. They will not be a Matt Dumber. And I can name this probably in a couple of minutes because at this point, 97% of NHL players is white. And of the remaining 3%, only 26 players are black. That is bad enough, but imagine being Willie O'Ree when you are the only Black person. And that's you have no one to follow, no one who has made the steps to make it easy for you to show you the way. And it is pretty ridiculous how, how white this sport is um, and how Willie O'Ree is still working hard to make changes, to make sure that there are kids out there who want to be a hockey player who can be a hockey player because they can see someone that looks like them as he said it is easy when everybody looks like you the guy in the hall of the flame fame looks like you every number one draft pick looks like you in fact probably the whole draft looks like you the guy hoisting the sandy cup looks like you that's easy but he becomes that person to show that you know what no matter what happens you can you can do it and I actually listened to this on audiobook, and um, it is narrated by Alfred Fitzhugh, who is also made NHL history. He became the first full-time Black broadcaster, the only Black play-by-play -play announcer at any professional level of North American ice hockey in, uh, for the Seattle Krakens. And if you know hockey, you know that Seattle Krakens were established last year. So until 2021, there has been no Black announcers. That is how bad this sport is. So, you know, it is just for a lot of these players, it is people like Willie O'Reed that made such a big difference and they look up to him so much. Um, so I would say if you are looking for a book for inspiration, um, a story that shows someone who has that perseverance, that attitude, that discipline to make it to the top, to the best league in the world. If you're interested in hockey, just the history of hockey, because Willie in this book talks a lot about not just the National Hockey League, but also the other leagues. And it's super interesting if you like hockey and especially through that lens of like other um, history that you may not hear of. I um, highly, highly recommend that. I can talk about hockey forever and ever, but I will stop now. Um, so this is Willie O'Ree, um, the game-changing story of NHL's first Black player. Thanks, Virginia. Um, very eloquently um, described um, Willie O'Ree's story and also, um, you know, the, the lack of diversity in the NHL. Um, yeah, that one kind of hit me in the feels. I'm not gonna lie. Um, so it sounds like sounds like a great a great book. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that um, none of us on the panel today um, are black, but I feel that it is so important that you know, no matter no matter what your background is, it's really important um, that we that we seek out, that we try, that we read books by individuals from all kinds of backgrounds who have all kinds of story to tell us just give it a try uh, because i feel like we have we have a lot a lot to learn uh, from each other uh, about about what each other has gone through um things we can avoid in the future um but also you know about the human condition ultimately uh to hear for example of willie o'ree's struggles um you know who can't who can't relate to that? Who can't relate to, you know, having a dream and having a goal, uh, having obstacles, and um, 
you know, persevering against those? And how, how can you not be inspired by that, regardless of, you know, whether you're black like him or, or, or you're from a different cultural background? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's, there's certain lessons that I feel like apply to all of us and we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore those or overlook those um, because, you know, we may be fixated on differences rather than our similarities. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to forego a, a, a deep existential question today. Um, but I, I do want to encourage uh, anybody who may be local to Port Moody um, in, in the lower mainland to check out our brand new social justice book club sets. Now we, we did sort of give a teaser about this during one of our episodes last year. Uh, and these sets are finally ready to go. So if you are interested in starting your own book club, um, you know, no matter how small it is, it could be two of you, it could be you know, 10 of you, um, you know, people that you're comfortable talking with, um, that you want to share ideas with, that you want to bounce your thoughts over what you've read uh, off of in a, in a safe environment that you have control over. Um, I highly encourage you to check those book club sets out. Um, it, they include books by Black authors, Black Canadian authors, um, and, and also, you know, different different diverse groups. Um, so these are here for you. They include um, um, some jumping off points to talk about various topics of diversity and inclusion and, you know, in a thoughtful and a timely way. Um, so again, challenging, you know, issues that challenge not just marginalized people, but all of us. These are issues that affect every single one of us because sadly, um, you know, as we have seen, we are not all equal. That's a fact. Um, we'd like to champion diversity, but it's time we do something about it. Um, so movements like hockey is for everyone is great, but let's see some results for those. So one way we can do that, even if we feel you know, we're just one person. One way we can start doing that is to open up these conversations, make them less taboo, um, be more open, ask questions. Questions are good, questions aren't bad, uh, and educate ourselves uh, and get to thinking about, um, you know, ways we can be better and understanding each other a little bit better as well. All right, well. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us today on Keep It Fictional. Again, a podcast brought to you by the Port Moody Public Library. If you're ever looking for something to read, not sure where to go, drop us a line. You can find us on social media, our website, as well as in-house if you're local, and we'd be happy to help find the book for you. So thank you to all of our panelists today, and we hope you'll join us for a future episode. Mm -hmm.